All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to week two of CNET 58. Uh, today, we're going to um, kind of talk about our semester approach to uh, our design and what we really intend to accomplish um, in this course, okay? So, for example, um, what type of servers do we need? What services do we need to provide? What kind of security um, considerations do we need to make? What kind of backup plan do we need? Uh, what kind of access are we going to need our clients to have? So all of this is going to tie into um, how we're going to uh, kind of approach the rest of the, the semester. All right, so if you, have a um, access to the canvas, you can follow along in the um, PowerPoint there. And so there, there's our um, PowerPoint for today. All right, and then I'm going to um, uh, interject some of the things about the lab and then uh, I'll unlock or um, publish the lab so that we can get into that here um, in a little bit as well. Okay, uh, any questions or comments from last week before we move forward? Make sure you have to unmute yourself before you can comment. Okay, so doesn't look like uh, in, any there. You can also pop them in the chat. I have another window with the chat on it. All right, so when we design our network and our server project, um, we, we have to kind of look at this as we're starting as a consulting company, okay? So I want you to, you know, put on your little consultant hat and for the rest of this term, for this spring semester, think of yourself as you're an IT consultant who's been asked by a customer to design and build out their server, which in infrastructure, which will include, of course, their network um, infrastructure as well. So here you have it. You finally have the consulting project you've been waiting for. A customer is building a new office and has asked you to design their entire local area network as their present infrastructure is outdated and as ports failing all the time. So this is a consultant's dream. However, it can become a nightmare for you and your company if you don't do things properly, right? So let, let's look at some of the design issues that we need to consider when we start a new land. I mean, it's not as simple as just saying, well, um, Jared, go buy a couple switches. Uh, El Michael, go get buy a router. Duke, can you get some cable? Uh, Jose, can you, can you get some, uh, a firewall? Uh, uh, Ryan, can you go, you know, set up a couple servers? I mean, it's it's more to it than just grabbing the parts and build it as we go, right? This is one of those opportunities where we really want to take the time to design and think our way around our setup, okay? So to do that, Microsoft has created what they call the Microsoft Solutions Framework. And um, I don't know what your relationship is with Microsoft, but one thing I will give them the highest credit for is their documentation and their how to's and some of their framework design uh, is some of the best in the industry. And that's why they've been so successful for you know 40 years now. So they, they created this solutions framework and it's a framework designed for um, an IT project. Now, project management is a big part of IT, 
right? In some of these larger IT shops and these larger corporate IT environments, they need people that are, all they do is project manage, right? They manage projects from the beginning to the end. And one of the key parts of that will be this Microsoft solution framework. Now, notice on this slide here, it shows that we have iterations. And this is gonna be very, very true for a lot of the things that is done in an IT environment, is it's not just step one, step two, step three, step four, stamp it, finished, and move on, right? A lot of times you, well, let's let's start it, and then something comes up. We weren't expecting that. Perhaps the the distance between the buildings is a little longer than our equipment will reach, whether it's wireless or wired. So we may have to, okay, we need to uh, come up with another plan. How are we going to solve that problem? And it's sometimes as you unwrap the integration that the need for another solution will come up, okay? So it's very important that we understand that these processes are iterative. So we may go step, step one, step two, go back to step one, go back to step one, go back to step one, right? right repeat as necessary and then keep going, all right? So <clears throat> the Microsoft Solution um, Framework and this is taken from Microsoft's webpage, is a set of principles, models, disciplines, concepts, and guidelines for delivering, delivering IT solution. And this can ensure that the foundation of our projects are carefully planned, roles and tasks are clearly identified and defined, and that the thousands of crucial details are addressed for successful implementation. Because there are so many little things that we as the IT professional and the server admin, we need to be um, cognizant of so that when they pop up later on, we've given that a little thought. Because the last thing you wanna do is get halfway into a project, something comes up and you're set there going, I never even thought of that. I did not realize that we needed this adapter to connect this fiber to this switch. And here you are in the you know, implementation phase and all of a sudden you need to order a part and you come to find out it's back ordered for three months. And then what do you do? Uh, I don't know. I mean, so you, you have to be prepared. All right, so we're gonna go, we're gonna walk through these phases. This is something I think is very important for us as IT professionals, and especially when we look at it through the lens of a server um, technician, be aware of, because we may need to give our input into some of these areas down the road, right? Some of you in the next six months may, you know, get hired into a position and um, you'll want to make sure that you're aware of uh, everything that's going on. Uh, all right, so the first phase is the envisioning phase. And this is where we're going to really use our vision and our imagination, and we're gonna envision the scope and um, the identifies the vision this, and the scope of the project. Now, before we go um, any further, someone, someone in your own words, tell me what does scope mean so go ahead and unmute yourself and just interject like how far reaching the project is going to affect okay so by far reaching um give me an example of that that term like you would be um just discussing like, is it going to only affect this building? Is it going to affect this room? Is it going to affect this um, this campus if it's uh, for a college, for instance, or is it only just going to be for one location or two locations? Right, exactly. You know, is it only the accounting team that 
needs to deal with this or will it be all the students will it be all our um, constituents will it be board members so exactly right louis is how far and how deep does does the project um reach right because not not every project is going to involve every single constituent or every single you know team member in your your department or in your your um enterprise right some things you know you may we may be talking about rolling out a new printer solution in the library and that, that we don't have to worry about well what are the uh the faculty over in the business division doing while we do our library up you know um printer upgrade so you you want to identify that because we would not want to send out a notice that, and say all it services are turned off while we update the library printers because that would be extremely disruptive to everybody else right so we want to kind of keep it in those in those ideas so during this phase good, thank you for answering that too louis during this phase the envisioning phase the goals for the project are formed and a vision statement is created that defines the entire project. So when we say like a vision statement, that's, that's where we look at and we say, this will answer why are we doing this? What is the reason for this project? And I think sometimes in IT, we like to do projects because they're cool because it's trendy, because it's the latest and greatest, you know, situation. Like, like we may say, well, we need a face uh, recognition um, project. We need to identify every single person that walks into building 28B with, um, by facial recognition, where they have to scan their face or walk through a, an area that will scan their face, <clears throat> identify them, um, determine what what door needs to be open when they get close to it you know have a maybe a proximity monitor on them and we may come up with a, a really cool idea but then when we go to the dean and the the people that hold the the purse strings right the financial and we say this is our project we really think it'd be cool and then they say well what will that benefit us what does that do that having a professor in the classroom with the door open would already, I mean, can't the professor when someone walks in their classroom or other students when someone walks in their classroom identify them after, you know, the first couple of days? And it would, that would be a hard sell, right? And if we said, well, it's really cool. Everybody's doing this, you know, we, we have to get on board with this Otherwise, we're not cool. I mean, or we're not happening or we're not. And, you know, there may be some Silicon Valley startups or some high energy tech companies that thrive on being on the cutting edge. But uh, most of businesses, you know, corporate America and corporate, you know, world, right? Is a, the world environment is really, really important right now. Um, they just want to answer the question, so what? What does this do for us? You know, what's the benefit? Because why are businesses in business? Anybody? To make money. To make money, exactly. They're not out there. I mean, if if there's a, say, a, a shoe company, you know, they design their own shoes and sell them online. And, you know, they they are successful in that element. They would, they would care less about facial recognition of people on their website. I mean, they, they just want to be super intrusive. And two, why? What does that matter? I mean, um, unless you could do a foot recognition and, you know, right size their shoe right away, you know, take off your shoe and stick it up to your webcam and we're going to measure your foot um, and give you the right size. Now, that may have some benefit. Although most people are pretty comfortable, you know, identifying their shoe size, but still, 
Okay, so that's what we're doing here is what is the vision? And then we have to look at it and we'll get into the financial side here in a little bit, but we have to see what is this project and why is this project? Now, during the envisioning phase, we will also look at uh, identifying risks and then the preparation of mitigation and contingency plan is also done in the envisioning phase. So mitigation is what do we do if something goes sideways, right? What are our alternative plans or our if this, then that? And then a contingency is, you know, if, if we do this and it doesn't work, what are our options, you know? Or what if it doesn't function the way we thought it was? I mean, have any of you ever worked somewhere or been a part of a project where it was promised all of these functions and features. And then when you actually use it, it's no better or maybe it's worse than what you had previously, right? And you're going, well, I thought this was supposed to be better. It's, it's more clunky and less effective as the previous one. So uh, we, we want to have some contingencies um, th there. Okay, so Ian said kind of like, pre-ordering ordering a video game. Exactly. If you buy the hype, well, sometimes you don't get the same results, right? Um, sometimes, you know, it, the commercials, the trailers, the, the preliminary uh, review of something looks really, really awesome. And that may be, you know, one one hundredth of what you actually get. Um, uh, so comp, Call of Duty is the worst. <laughs> okay. Uh, every recent call. Okay. So everybody's hitting on Call of Duty. All right. So let's, let's go to the next slide. So in the envisioning phase, we look at the vision, the scope, the identification of risks, and then prepare for mitigation and contingency. In the planning phase, this is where we're going to take what we envision and overlay it, put it over the top of what we actually have. What, a, what does our existing environment have that we can either use or we can modify or we need to replace, okay? So um, the, the main activity here is getting into the details. So the the detail planning it is there to ensure the success of the the project right you you've probably heard the old adage if if you don't plan for success you're never going to have it right so planning is uh really the key ingredient here now in this phase the planning phase a master project plan is created and this will be a document it may be a document that has, you know, schematics, blueprints, maybe some diagrams, um, where it will will it'll be used kind of like a blueprint or architecture's uh, design, so that when they get into, you know, the fourth floor of a 50 floor building, um, they can always go back and look at the diagram and say, this is. Uh, what, what we're doing on this floor, you know, because they may not remember. So it's a guiding document here. Now, the focus is going to come back onto the budget in this phase. So in the planning phase, this is where we'll start sharpening up our pencil and we'll start saying we're going to need, you know, six servers, four routers, 32 switches, you know, 500 meters of, you know, cat six cable and all, all the various um, things. We need this type of network card in our servers. Um, so this is where we'll start looking at that, the budget, the quality, the schedule, right? If we present a plan to the administration or to say the, the CEO, CFO, we should have an idea of when it's gonna start, when it's gonna stop, when it's going to, uh, when our payments are due, right? What uh, the cost is and um, what kind of technical 
implementation will be there as well. Okay, so that's the planning phase. And then the third phase of the Microsoft Solution Framework is the building phase. So this is where we really get into the details of what do we need to build. Now, build and implement are different. Building is if we replace, say, our mail server with the cloud, do we need any kind of custom code? Do we need any scripts that will run so that the first time a user logs on to the new the old system, it will automatically redirect them, grab their Active Directory information, and send it to our cloud server, right? Our cloud situation, so that the link will be transparent, or that it will be as least uh, invasive as possible. Okay. So custom code and scripts will be done here. And the components that need to be rewritten are developed. Now, in our home networks and our home you know, server environment, we probably don't have a lot of custom stuff, right? We haven't had a developer, whether a web developer or a, a code, you know, a, a programmer come in or, you know, that's on our staff to write specific pieces of software to integrate system one with system two. In larger environments where the, maybe they're not using all Windows server or all Linux server, they may have a combination of some older Linux implementations, some older server implementations, some newer, you know, uh, uh, Dell workstations that have custom interfaces, you know, proprietary OEM stuff or so forth. So the, the ability for those to, to work, we have to consider that because we can't just come in and say, here's our new server project and then find out nobody can access it or, you know, 30% of the company can't access it because their workstations are not compatible with it, the solution would not be, well, we need to just buy 30% new, new um, workstations. That's not gonna fly, right? We need to custom our server infra infrastructure to fit, right? Not make everybody else fit into that particular solution, but make our solution fit what's already there. So this is where, that's what the building phase is all about. Now, if we make um, syntax compliancy, performance and security, we wanna make sure that any changes we make are in line with either federal regulations or local regulations or our company's policies and update our procedures. So whatever we change, we need to make sure that there's a ripple effect where all those changes go throughout the system so that uh, you know a year from now, we don't run into, why do we have the security hole? Why has this been so, you know, we left this, this port or this system completely open and we didn't even know about it, right? So we wanna make sure before we make changes, we don't accidentally leave something vulnerable or leave something um, uh, in a position where we, we can't uh, ensure that it's secure. Now, remember, all of the Microsoft Solution Framework is iterative, which means we, we may come back to it. The building phase is one where we will come back to this many, many times because we're going to have to rethink when we get to this part, how does it fit with the rest of it? Okay, um, any questions so far on the envisioning phase, the planning phase and the building phase? Yeah, how do you know you're not going overkill with some of your upgrades or even implementation of a server system? That's the budget will a lot of times be our, our guards, you know, our, um, our, you know, like, have you ever bumper bowl 
right? Where those little bumpers are in there, it keeps you from getting out of the lane. Um, our budget, a lot of times will will do that. Or we just don't have the expertise, right? We may say, well, we want a, um, we want an IT robot, right? <laughs> Let's just say we want to build our own droid that will, you know, uh, be our first line of defense. Uh, when someone comes into the, the IT shop, the help desk, they're going to interact with, you know, whatever our robot's name is. Um, and that sounds like a really cool project, but when we go to do it and we start saying, well, does anybody know how to build a robot? And someone says, well, I assembled a model plane. I've done some work with some Arduinos. I've done, you know, we have a little bit of it and then we get in and we're way over our head. That would, you know, expertise will be a guide. Budget though is almost always the, the main thing there, Louie. I think it was you that said it, yeah. Um, Bud the robot, there we go. Um, so uh, this building phase is there. All right, any other questions? No? <laughs> Wally, <laughs> that's a great movie. All right, so the next phase is what we call the stabilizing phase. And in the stabilizing phase, this is where we will actually build the project in either a lab or a test environment. So, you know, ha have you ever um, watched a movie like of uh, the uh, early uh, European um, uh, history and, you know, somebody gets, gets caught, some soldier gets caught doing something against the king's wishes and they'll put them in front of the firing squad, right? We really don't have firing squads anymore, hopefully. Um, but they, they, they go like this, right? They, the, the sergeant of the guard or whoever's in charge of the, the firers, the people with the rifles, they say, ready, fire, aim, right? And that the way, they, the way they do that is, you know, you just fire first and then you aim later. And hopefully, you know, if you're the one on the firing squad, if I was the one with the, the, the um, blindfold and the cigarette, I would hope that they would do it that way. They'd say, ready, fire, aim. But we want to make sure that we don't end up shooting ourselves in the foot. So we want to go ready, aim, fire, right? Put it in the right order. So this is where um, that I remember when, when I would, uh, when I was an IT director and an IT um, worker, I always wanted to be as prepared as possible. So if someone called me and said, hey, I'm having a problem with whatever, say, uh, I can't get Excel to do this on this pivot table. Well, I don't work with Excel every day. So I would take 10 minutes, read up on everything I needed to do, get out my manuals and all that stuff. So that when I went over there and I sit with, you know, the person that has having the problem with Excel, I look like I know what I'm doing, right? You wanna be prepared. You wanna be stable. You wanna look like, you know, you're on top of things. So in this phase, this is where we want to build out our solution in either a lab or a test environment. And this is where we will run into, remember when we came back and we were in um, this phase where detailed planning to ensure success? Well, we may have planned, let's say we're going to do a voice over IP phone system install. And we're going to replace their legacy phone system with a voice over IP. And if we just ordered all the equipment, so we're like, okay, yeah, this is piece of cake. We've done this before. We'll just get the phones. We'll take out their old phones, plug in their new phones. And within a couple hours, everybody will be up online. Well, what if we don't do the stabilizing phase? We don't do it in a lab or a test environment. And we have a technician, you know, 
that just carries all these boxes of phones, unboxes them, puts it on the desk, plugs it in, takes away the old phone, blah, blah, blah. And we're back in the server room and we're, you know, um, firing up the voice over IP server. And we're like, okay, that should do it. We go to all the phones, none of them turn on. None of them are connected. None of them are, you know, doing what we thought. Well, at that point, the guy who took all the old phones has already put them in a truck and is heading to the landfill to throw them away. And now we need to call that person and say, hey, we need you to bring those phones back so we can plug them back in to the old system so that they can still have phone um, telecommunications, right? The, the telephony. So the better solution would be to set up all the phones in, say, uh, an office or a warehouse or a lab environment somewhere and just have all the phones. So say we have, you know, 200 extensions, we'll plug in all 200 of those extensions into the equipment that they're going to be plugged into. We'll have our voice over IP server connected to it. We'll plug them all in and we'll see what happens. Well, this is where if they don't turn on, it's like, okay, we're not breaking any business flow here, right? The business continuity is still available, right? We haven't, we haven't said, you, well, sorry, your phones are offline because we don't know what's going on. I mean, we're not gonna look like that. So in our lab environment, that's where we can test things. That's where we can design, we can do our planning, our detail planning. It may be something as simple as, well, we just need to, on the back of the, there's, two ports on a voice over IP phone and in uh, a LAN and a, a VLAN, right? Maybe one's for um, connecting to the phone VLAN and then the other one connects directly to the workstation LAN, VLAN. Um, and maybe we just, we, we only had one plugin and we didn't, you know, get that pass through to work properly or we didn't enable it in software. So some of these fixes are easy, but, you know, how many of you have been under intense pressure and the easiest things sometimes are not that easy to find, right? When you're, when you're, you know, quivering and shaking from stress and anxiety and your, your sweat is falling in your eyes, you can't see properly. And it's something as simple as, well, you know, someone say, well, shouldn't you click that little button that says continue? And you're going, where, why won't this program work? And behind it is a, you know, press this key to continue and you're like, oh my gosh. So anyway, this is where we'll test the solution and then we're gonna verify it to be stable. So this is where we'll identify, you know, sometimes when you buy bulk amount of um, equipment, some of it doesn't work, right? Something may come out of the box and maybe it got banged up in shipping or maybe it's just a lemon or maybe it's, something just doesn't work right. This is where we want to find that. So if we need to order a replacement, we can just pause the project, you know, a couple of days until we get the new stuff or the replacement, and then we're good to go. Okay. Um, just check in my email, make sure no students are trying to get in and they can't. All right. So the, the stabilizing phase is where we'll do our, our lab build, all right? And then the, the next phase is the deploying phase. So this is where we actually deploy it. So this is where we take our tested solution, we move it into production, and then we transfer it to operations. So whatever system is being built, it will be um, implemented, we'll deploy it, and we'll have the sign off from the stakeholders that will confirm that the solution meets their requirements. So for example, if we say we're going to um, replace the printers in the library, the photocopiers in the printers in the library, it's going to have a, um, a facial recognition system that will identify the student and then directly connect to their um, student account so that whatever 
uh, prints or copies they make will just be uh, added to their, their student account. And if they have a, a credit, say they have um, some sort of grant or some sort of uh, voucher in place, it'll just deduct the, the prints right off of that. So that the student doesn't have to log in, they don't have to um, have their ID card. Um, they, they, they'll just go walk up to it. It'll, you know, if uh, Frankie walks up to it, it'll scan his face just uh, non-invasively and it'll say, uh, uh, good morning, Mr. Romero, I'm here to help and away you go, right? And if we do all that and that's exactly what the library is expecting and that's exactly what we give them, they'll sign off and say, okay, this is exactly what we thought we were gonna get. Um, looks good, uh, thank you, have a great day, right? And we walk away with our signed paperwork and away we go. But what, what if we, we come in and we say, well, here's your printers, here's the, the network copier, um, the, the facial recognition doesn't work. We couldn't get that to work, um, but the ID card system that the old system used, uh, will, we have that working with this system. Well, the state, the, the library, they may say, no, this isn't what we signed up for. This, this is not uh, you know, what we want. And then we may have to say, well, you know, unfortunately we ran into some problems and this is where a good communication will always um, benefit. You know, if we, if we were back in the um, stabilizing phase, hopefully this is where we would have figured that out. And we would have communicated that to the library prior to um, deploying it. Now, if we didn't, you know, and some of these IT companies, they try to sneak things by and, you know, they just want that check at the end of the day. And they're like, well, this is all we can do. There's nothing we can do about it, you know? And then you're stuck, you know, going, this isn't what I wanted, you know? It's like, if you order something from, you know, Instacart and they bring you your groceries and they substituted everything. Um, you know, sometimes they have to substitute something, but, you know, if instead of eggs, they gave you powdered eggs or instead of milk, they gave you, you know, um, uh, some sort of cream or, you know, whatever you, you'd go, no, this isn't going to work for me. Take it back. And they say, well, I can't, you know, uh, uh, then <laughs> there'd be some problems. So this is where, um, we want to make sure the solution meets the requirements during the envisioning and the planning phase. So that's the deployment phase. The next phase is the governing phase. Now, this really isn't a phase per se, but it's what happens once the project's done. So this is where we'll have user feedback, where we'll maybe have some um, surveys. We may have some pop-ups on the system that say, you know, we would like your feedback. Can you take a short quiz? Can you answer a couple of questions? And uh, we'll use that to modify the project or the plan if we have uh, an iterative update schedule. So uh, we may say, okay, in, in 30 days, we're gonna reevaluate the deployment and then we'll come back and we'll obtain the information then we'll go back to the drawing board, fix these problems, solve these problems, and then um, implement them at there. Because you know, the, at the end of the day, the continual improvement is one of the main goals of what we do, right? As IT, we never get to the end and just go, okay, we're done, see you later. Uh, once that system's in place, we know that Ultimately, um, they're going to come back. The users are going to expect us to support it, maintain it, and um, ensure that it's continually available. So user feedback is um, very, very crucial. All right. So those are the um, phases of the Microsoft Solution Framework. And they're all equally important, but you've probably figured out or you know just from your own life experiences you know the better 
the more time and effort you put in the planning side of things, the better the implementation or the deployment goes, right? So it's always crucial that we, we take a hard look at what exactly are we doing? Why are we doing it? And that way, when you get to the how do we do it, it you know, it, it will all make uh, more sense and the project will flow accordingly. Now, like I said, there, there are job descriptions in IT where their um, project management is a huge part of it. Um, a lot of times to move up into the higher echelons of IT management, you know, into maybe the chief technology officer, the, the senior network administrator, some of those job roles will require you to have some project management under your belt. So um, the, the, if you're in a company and they say, hey, we need some um, volunteers from this department to sit on a, a, a committee that's gonna you know, work on this particular project. Um, it might not sound real exciting to you at the time, but uh, the experience will be really good for that, okay? Uh, any questions on the MSF? You can just pop them in the chat and I'll refer to them here uh, as we go. All right, so now that we kind of know how to do a plan, let, let's get into some of the, the nuts and bolts of what we're doing. Now, one of the things that is very, very important is that we need to understand that IT work, right? When we, we may be a server administrator and we may have the poor job attitude that, well, all I care about are servers. I don't really care to, you know, these guys over here are talking about, you know, the, the payment system. These are other people are talking about the firewalls and someone is talking about the, the premise wiring, right? The, the, um, category cable or the fiber optic cable. And we just go, ah, that, that's not my job. That's not my job, not my prob, right? We might think, well, that, that doesn't really, that, I don't really need to worry about that. I'm, in, I'm more focused on, you know, these servers. That's what I do. Well, it's super impor important or imperative that we as the IT understand what, the business does, right? IT does not exist just for the sake of IT. IT exists, IT functions, IT services are there so that the business can do their core business, right? So we may say, well, I just work on the servers. And let's say we work at, say, a uh, an automotive dealership, right? The corporate office, say for Honda or something. And we may say, well, I'm just worried about the servers. Well, we should be aware of this. How do our sales force, how does our financial for services, how do the management, how does the delivery, how does the um, service, all of those areas, you know, the maintenance, how do all those tie together so that we can make sure that our server is actually doing what it's supposed to do, right? If we just say, well, this is my server and I just wanna make sure it turns on and there's no lights that tell me there's a problem with any of the disks or the, you know, the network cables are connected, that's all I care about is that if I walk up to this server and these five lights are on and they're all green, I've done my job. Well. No, you haven't. You, you have to make sure that those services that are there are actually doing what we expect them to do. So this last line here on this slide says, remember, servers are used in business to generate revenue or provide a service. There are always business implications to any and all IT services. So as us as, as IT professionals, if we can um, 
exude or display that kind of an attitude that, hey, I'm here to help you do your job better through technology, right? Imagine if every worker felt that kind of support from their IT department and their server admins. I mean, it, there would be such good dialogue that they would come up with really outstanding processes and workflows that would make the company extremely successful, right? And the, the job satisfaction, the employee satisfaction and work in there would be through the roof, right? They, they would just be super happy. So we wanna make sure that we're able to um, think in those terms, not just in this narrow mindset of, you know, with my, say I'm a horse and I have blinders on and all I do is walk straight because I can't see left or right, right? That's my path. That's all I see. That's all I'm gonna do. Well, we need to take off those blinders, look around a little bit, use our peripheral vision and see what's, you know, how we can um, tie into everything else, okay? So when we get into this pre-deployment phase, so before we do anything back in, before we even start the um, envisioning phase, we need to be able to look at our um, network infrastructure. And by infrastructure, uh, you know, we, we hear the um, uh, politicians always say, well, we need to update the infrastructure of the United States, right? And then they'll come back and then say, most bridges in the United States are, you know, at least 50 years old. The freeways are, you know, 40 years old. The, the telecom systems with the above wire, uh, above ground cabling, those are 30 years old. The fiber optic that was pulled in the late 90s, early, that's now 20 some years old. And we need to update the infrastructure, right? And all of that is true, obviously. I mean, um, if you've driven on a freeway or stopped on a bridge and you look, you know, uh, any of you have ever get in traffic and you're under an overpass and you look up, you know, why you have time while the traffic stopped, you know, you're in traffic and you're like, why are there, why are there these huge cracks on this 30 ton piece of cement above my head? I mean, it's not real um, uh, confidence building, right? You're like, they should fix that. Well, they try to as best they can and budget willing. Well, when we look at the network infrastructure, so that's like our, our, highway infrastructure, but what about our networks? Well, when we talk about the network infrastructure, we're talking about the cabling, the switching, the routing, um, and any other connectivity, okay? Um, so to do that, we, I mean, if, if I asked, um, let's say uh, Troy, if I said Troy, I want you to look into the, the ceiling, put on your, uh, your glasses that allow you to see through walls and tell me what kind of cable is running through that ceiling to the next building. Um, Troy, I don't know how, how your uh, Hello. Gray glasses work, but um, mine don't work that way. Right, I can't see through walls. Can you? No, I cannot. Okay, so um, you know, but but what if I said, uh, Troy, I need you to look at the topology diagram, the document, and find out what type of cable is there, and how long is it is its run? Well, Troy or any of us could go if we have a good topology a physical topology, we can look it up and we could say, okay, here's that cable. I see it on the plan. Here it is on the diagram. And it says it's a um, single mode fiber optic, you know, uh, 62.5 micrometers cable. Uh, it's connects this building to the other building. It's exactly um, 1,823 meters. Well, now we know exactly what we're talking about, right? And that's the only way we can do it because a lot of this network stuff is not visible. 
right? It's, it's not on the exterior of our buildings or of our office spaces where we can just grab it and look at it and figure it out. So we need to make sure that we have these topologies. So the, the first topology we're gonna to talk about is the physical topology. And the physical topology refers to the placement of the network components, including the device locations and the cable installation. So what does a physical topology show us? Well, it's going to show us what type of devices are there, right? It'd be kind of nice to know, you know, if we're going, why, why is the maximum throughput from this building to this building, why is it only 100 megs? I have a gigabit switch on this side, a 10 gigabit on the other side. It should negotiate to at least gig, and the fastest I'm getting is 100 megs. Well, there may be some intermediate interconnected devices that are at 100 megs, right? Maybe they haven't been updated. And we're going, why is this? I know the cable is capable. I know the equipment on point A and point Z are capable. But what about in between, between B, C, D, E, all the way through? Are they updated? So that's where we would want to know the device, the models, and the manufacturers. And it'd be nice to know where they are, right? Which um, cabinet or which closet or which location, where are, is this equipment? So that we're not just kind of bumbling around going, I know there's a router in here somewhere. It's got to be between here and there. And you're just, you know, walking the wire trying to find it. Okay, so we should show that on our um, physical topology. We should know our operating system versions because there may be compatibility issues, right? There may be a feature in CentOS 8 that was not around during CentOS 6. And we may have some servers that are still running CentOS 6. And it's not as easy as saying, well, let's just snap our finger and update all of them to CentOS 8. That, that's a project, right? We need to go through the MSF and make sure what are the implications, right? Can we update it? Will the server, can it support it? Does it have enough memory? Does it have enough CPU? Does it have enough hard drive space to even install the update? You know, so all those things, it's, it's not just that simple. So, uh, and then the cable types and then the endpoints. So the physical topology shows the actual blueprint location. So this is like a picture on a diagram that we could look at and say, here's building one, here's closet seven, here's the third floor, here's the cabling room number, you know, 3A. And we can look at and say, there's, that's where that router is. Router two is in the third floor, building one, room 3A. So now if we say, you know, um, uh, Robert, go, go, uh, run this uh, update on the, this server, go make sure that the, the access control list is updated to include these services. He knows exactly where to go. He's not just running around campus all day going, um, has anybody seen router three? Hello? Excuse me, you know, I mean, <laughs> you look silly doing that. So the physical topology is the blueprint. Now, the logical topology is different. Physical blueprint logical shows us more like a schematic, right? Like have, have any of you ever looked in your owner's manual for your car? Or um, if you uh, have ever done any car repair, you look at the, um, the Shifton's manual, right? The, these old uh, how to fix cars um, diagrams. And sometimes they have really simple diagrams that show this system runs through these components and then it goes out through this system. Well, that's not how they're laid out in your car, right? In your car that they may be all over the place. Some may be under the hood, some may be in the trunk, some of it may be you know, behind the, the, the glove box. But the logical topology will just show it kind of, this is the linear progression. So it shows the flow of data. And on our network topologies, 
that's exactly what we'll want to see. So we may not need to know where the server is for the logical, but we should show who has access to it, right? How do they get access to the server via what network? How can this network get to that server? Well, it's going to have to go through the devices that are part of the physical topology. But now we'll just say, here's a workstation, here's a switch, here's a server. It goes through the switch to the server. Now, in reality, that switch may be in a closet. That server may be across campus. But logically, that's how they connect. So our logical topology shows the data flow without the regard to the physical design. So it, it's just like a picture or a schematic compared to a, a blueprint, okay? So on our logical topology, we'll still have our di device identifiers, you know, switch one, SW2, you know, RT9 or whatever our naming convention is. And we'll talk about naming convention later, um, but it should show us our IP address and subnet mask. So we know what network it is what interface it's connected to. So, you know, on our routers, we may have um, our LAN interfaces, our WAN interfaces, our um, uh, different fiber optic interfaces that are built into it. So we want to know which one's connected to what. We should know what kind of routing protocols we're using. You know, are we using um, uh, static routing? Are we using dynamic routing? If we're using dynamic routing, is it uh, you know, a, a routing protocol that updates itself automatically or does it have to look at its neighbors to figure it out? And then what kind of protocols are we using? And then if it's wide area networking, what are the technologies are we, that we're gonna use? Are we, are we gonna use you know, Spectrum's business in, for our WAN? Are we going to use a least, uh, line from the telephone company for our WAN technologies or whatever the case may be. So that's our logical topology. So here, here's a logical topology. So it just shows, hey, we don't really care how or where this internet connection is, as long as we can show it. So we have internet comes into our router and firewall. So this is a multi-purpose device. Some of it goes over this network, 192.168.2.0. And these are the department servers in the admin group. The another leg of the router goes over to 192.168.1.0, and those are our classrooms. So if if we were to send a technician to the classroom, and if we said this interface right here, you know, we may have a call out or we may have some documentation that says this is our default gateway for this network segment, 192.168.1.0. 254, let's say we use our last IP address for our router. And then someone in classroom one says, one of the machines over here cannot get internet access. Well, we, we can look at this logical topology and say, well, this classroom connects to this switch, right? Some sort of backbone switch that connects to this router that connects to the internet. So just from a troubleshooting standpoint, we'd probably say, can, let's say that the workstation is 192.168.1.2, can it ping 192.168.1.254? If the answer is no, well then we know there's some sort of physical connection problem. If it can, then we know maybe a, um, a, a routing protocol or a route, default route isn't defined properly. So knowing, just looking at this, we would do that. So this is the logical topology. Then a physical topology would show us uh, where things are physically. So now we see, here's our admin office, here's our servers, even though on this diagram, they look like they're all together, they're actually in separate buildings across some streets, right? As well as, you know, how do they interconnect? Well, all the classroom buildings, the switch isn't in this room, even though it looks like it logically, Physically, it's not, right? Physically, the switch is over here in this switching closet. So knowing that, so if we were to say, okay, 
now we can't ping from 1.2 to the firewall. And if we were to go, we would need the physical topology to say, okay, here's PC1, 2. We need to go, okay, how does it connect to this hub? How does it connect to this switch? How does it connect to this router? So we may need to get in our little golf cart and drive all around campus to figure out where things are actually physically connected. Okay. So are there are there any questions on the topology stuff? Okay, so so I need to give you time. I know like in a classroom, I see right away if somebody has a question, you can, you know, raise your hand or um, whatever. But I anybody have a question? Let me give you time to respond. No questions? Everybody's probably asleep or watching YouTube, Netflix. Um, okay, someone said, nope. Thank you, Robert. So um, the the physical topology, somebody tell me what, what would, are some of the things we would see on the physical topology? You can put it in the chat or you can, <laughs> get it to Miller, there you go. That channel's fire. <laughs> So someone, someone unmute yourself and tell me what, what are some of the things you would see on a physical topology? I'll help you here. You guys are so shy today. Last week you're, you're chatty. So you're gonna see device types, models, operating system versions, where are they physically located? And then logically, We'll have the IP address, subnet mass, um, routing protocols, static and default routes, connection types, uh, right? That's on the physical, right? With the fiber optic and the cabling and so forth. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna stop right here. We'll, we're gonna pause the recording. All right, so uh, hopefully your um, Red Bull's nice and warm, right, uh, Jared? <laughs> and Ian. Um, so let's let's uh, look at some other things that we need to know about with regards to the before we do anything with our servers, right? So um, someone asked in the the lab or in the chat, Gerson did about there is a lab today. There will be a lab. I don't have it published yet because I don't want you to start doing the lab in the middle of the lecture and then everything gets um, uh, confusing for you. So I wanna go through that kind of a little more systematically. So some of the things we need to know about our network, obviously the first thing is um, what's the addressing, right? So that if we're, if we're going to deploy a, a new server, we need to know where does it fit into our IP address scheme? Right, and then we should know: Are is it does it need a public IP address or a private IP address? Now, can anybody um, tell me what's the difference between a public IP address and a private IP address? I know some of you have taken CNET 56 or a, a networking class. Uh, some of you are taking that now. Um, some of you may have taken the Network Plus class. So go ahead and unmute yourself and tell me. What is the difference between a private IP address and a public IP address? Anybody? Well, I know that private IP addresses are within a very small range of IP addresses. Like there's only, I think, uh, like a couple hundred private IP addresses where there's like thousands of public ones, if that makes sense. Okay, so um, JP said on the chat, private IP is on your private network, public is for the internet. And that's true. And the main thing between a public IP and a private IP is public IP addresses are routable on the internet, whereas private IP addresses are not routable. So 
if we were to set up to a router and give it a private IP address and we wanted to it to route that traffic to the internet, it wouldn't work. We would have to um, do some other things uh, with it. So private I, private doesn't fully expose the internet. That's exactly right too. Okay. And then um, what what does NAT stand for? I have a thing on there. NAT question mark. Anybody know what does NAT stand for? Is it network address translation? Exactly. Translate. Right. So normally when we do our our home internet routers they are designed automatically to NAT our private IP address, which is our home network, to the internet, which is our ISPs network. And even though I said private IP addresses are not routable on the internet, with network address translation, they are. So we can take our home network, which is 192.168.something.something, .something, .something, and it will translate it into a public IP address 140.144.something.something uh, .140 .something, and the router will do that translation for us. But it's only when we have a NAT service, a network address translation service on it. And all of our home routers, um, they automatically do that. They're, that's their design, okay? And But we should know about that, right? We should know how that happens so that when we deploy our server, it's ready or capable of either doing that or working with that, all right? Now, the, the firewall rules and policies, we may set up our server and then realize nobody can access it because they're being blocked at the firewall or our security policies are preventing it. So we need to go in and modify or change the firewall rules to allow that. So for example, if, if our server, our ESXi server did not have port 443 open on it, which is the SSL port, right? For the, our HTTPS service, we would not be able to use the internet or the web to connect to it. And then we couldn't do anything on it. So we, we wanna make sure all that's happening. And then we, we may need to know where this server is going to be deployed. Is it going to be in the DMZ, which is the demilitarized zone? Um, and in, in networking, that means it's in between our internet firewall and our corporate firewall. That area in between, that kind of no man's land is known as the DMZ. Um, if it's in there, there's certain things we wanna make sure it's configured to do and certain things that it's not configured to do. And then we should also know, is it ready for IP version six, right? IPv6 has um, been around for a long time now, but still not 100% deployed. And that's because of the intermediate equipment, routers and firewalls and servers that are not IPv6 capable, um, they're not ready yet. So, you know, we need to ask these questions. We need to look at, are we using remote technology, remote access, and is it in different geographical locations? And if so, are there language um, differences, right? Do we need to have a language pack on our web server so that based on the IP address, right, we can look and say this connection is coming from, you know, Indonesia, let's change the language to, you know, the, the local language that most people in that area would be able to understand. Or do we leave it as English and then just kind of deal with the translation problems, right? So from a business standpoint, we need to know, um, you know, if we deploy the server and it's going to have client connectivity from different parts of the world, how are we gonna deal with the, the language barrier? How are we gonna deal with, you know, um, you know their, their keyboard uh, mapping that's different, right? We may say your password must contain uppercase, lowercase, special character. Well, what if in their language, there is no special characters, right? Or the one we choose is not available in their, in their alphabet. 
you know, there, there's all kinds of situations that we'd have to look at for that. Okay. Um, we should also look at the traffic patterns. So we may think that um, a really good time to do our backups is between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., right? We have a little four window, four hour window to do our backups, but we don't look at the network traffic to find out that that's when somebody else in another part of the world is accessing our system very, very heavily. Well, we certainly don't want to do our backups when there are a lot of active users on our system. So, you know, lulls and slow times are best for our installations or our updates, right? It's not uncommon for IT to say, hey, John and, and Randy and, you know, Sylvia, I need you guys to come in at midnight and work on this update over, you know, from midnight till seven o'clock in the morning. Um, that's going to be your work day. Uh, and find out they take down a server and it takes off, you know, a bunch of users. We don't want to do that. Okay. So we need to be aware of that. So here, here's just a quick look at the resource monitor, the Resmon in a Windows machine. So these are in, when we talk about monitoring um, and when we take a, uh, a snapshot of our typical usage, we call that a baseline. And the, we normally in baseline, we talk about the big four, which is CPU, disk, network, and memory. So like on this system, we can see this server has a 44, 5% utilization. Um, and, but the 44% the of its maximum frequency is being used on the CPU and the 65% of the memory is being used. So if we were to monitor this server and over time, let's say this 65 turns into 98%, and this 44 turns into 79%. We might want to think about, you know, as far as utilization, we won't want to say, well, let's just stick this new service. Let's say we're going to do a file share. Let's put it on this, this um, machine because the network utilization is really low. The disk utilization is really low, right? So that would be our reasoning to say, well, let's put a file share on this server, but it's already pegging out, maxing out the memory and CPU. Th these would be good things to know before we do that, right? So that's why we're looking at these things now, you know, the ready aim fire technique, okay? So here's performance monitor um, within Windows. And these, both of these tools are native to the Windows um, operating system. So if they're Windows machines, we can run these um, monitors real easily. So here's the performance monitor with the showing the processes and memory again, All right? And you can see some of them are really spiked up. We want to take those into account. And one say, you know, why why are these things going so high? And then two, you know, what can we do to mitigate that and prevent it from being problematic? All right. So some more. Uh, network infrastructure evaluation would be, um, are there special scenarios? You know, is our server doing AAA, right? With the authentication, authorization, and accounting, right? Are we using an authentication protocol? How are we authorizing, right? How do, how do we set up our permissions? And then how do we keep track of all that with the accounting? If we're doing that, and we put our new server, let's say we put a new um, uh, portal or not a new portal, but a new um, single sign-on server for our website, um, our wireless connectivity, right? So as soon as someone hits our wireless, they connect their device. The first thing they get is a login page. So we set up that, that system. Well, how do you, how does our wireless authenticate? How does our wireless authorize? Where is the the accounting, the the um, screen, the the trail of log files, and where are all those kept? 
So we, we should know where that is or how it's set up so that when we put this new system in there, we don't end up with two of them. You know, well, this does it, and then the other, you have to do it twice. That, that users do not like that, right? They want, I just want to log in once and be done with it. I don't want to log in when I go here, log in when I go here, log in when I go here, especially if it's all in the same company. That, that's extremely frustrating for the end user experience. So we should know where those things are. Okay, the network card requirements are, do we use an ether channel? An ether channel is um, typical on Cisco switches and routing devices. We can do what's known as channel bonding, where we can take two separate channels and make it a bigger pipe. So we bond them together or combine them. Um, in, in Windows, that's called teaming. Right, network card teaming. We can team our network cards together in um, on our switches and our uh, routing devices. That's known as if they're Cisco and everything is Cisco or Cisco compatible. Um, it's called ether channeling. Okay, are there requirements for that? Are we using fiber optics? If we're using fiber optics, do we have the right adapters? Do we have the right cable? Right, a single mode. Fiber optic cable is very much different than a multi-mode fiber optic cable. So you as a server tech, you've got to be able to almost by sight, just by recognizing the, the color and the connection, is this the right one for what I'm doing? Because the last thing you want to do is, you know, climb to the top of some building where, you know, the, the fiber optic connectors are, where they go into a pipeline that go under go across the, the track there, um, you, know, you don't want to go up there and then realize, oh, I don't have the right connector. And then I have to call all the way back down, call all the way back up with the right one. And, you know, you want to make sure you're aware of that. So these are all some of the pre-deployment things. Okay, we should be able to, to assess the systems. So we should be able to look at what the hardware inventory is. What our software uh, inventory is. So let me, uh, in this, um, uh, in yours, there's a link in here. When I present it this way with the share uh, PowerPoint, the links don't work. Uh, so anyway, so the knowing what hardware is out there. And we're going to do a lab. We'll do a lab where we'll use um, Microsoft's uh, uh, system information to will create a server, install this service on it, and it will go out and it will reach out into all of our network and then come back with what's on it. Super handy. I mean, if if I were to ask you what machines on your, are on your home network, you probably would just sitting at your desk or sitting wherever you're sitting right now, you'd probably go, well, I have this, I have this, I have this, right? You're aware of well, this is Windows 10, this is running, you know, Mac OS 10.12, this, you know, whatever it is. Um, but what if I, if you were at work and there's 5,000 connections and, you know, 10,000 employees worldwide and, and your boss said, how many of these machines have an um, i5 or better sixth generation or newer? Well, that would be a tough one to just go, well, let me, let me think, hold on. Okay, mentally I'm on building four over there in the financial aid building. Okay, I'm in the office. I mean, you could not keep track of that just from your mental mind. Um, so we need tools to do that. And we certainly wouldn't wanna say, um, hey Duke, walk around campus and give me a list of all the hardware that's in use in the department in the global level. I mean, we wouldn't see them for another month, right? He'd be out taking notes for forever. And by then something probably would change. So we need to be aware of the hardware inventory and then our software licensing, right? Are we using open source software? Do we have valid licenses? Are we in compliancy, right? Uh, a lot of times, um, you know, especially with the, the server sprawl that we talked about last week, sometimes it's easy to just end up with, well, I have one license for, you know, Windows Server, but I, 
I have six virtuals of it all using the same license. And obviously we're out of compliance. Now the machines aren't going to squawk. They're not going to say anything and say, you can't do that. But Microsoft may, or if they do an audit, they, they may say, hey, and by the way, you owe us, you owe us for five more licenses because you're out of compliance. And then of course, a fine with it. So we want to make sure that all that is there. Okay, we, we should be aware of something known as service level agreements. So the SLA determines who does what, right? We may have a problem with our WAN link between our, say our office in Walnut and our office in Scottsdale, Arizona. And if we call Scottsdale, they'll say, well, our, our connection's fine, we think it's on your end. So we call, say um, Verizon is our telecom here, and they may say, well, that's not really our problem. That has to do with, you know, Arizona's telecom. And then, you know, so we call them back and they say, well, it's not our problem. So they're pointing their finger and saying, you know, you're to blame and we don't know. Well, if we look at our SLA, with Verizon and we read through it and it says, if there's an outage between here and Arizona, we guarantee uptime within an hour. Otherwise you can, you're entitled to, you know, a partial refund for that day's costs. Um, we can call Verizon and say, just so you know, our agreement says that you'll get our connection up. Otherwise we can request um, uh, financial res responsibility on your end and then they'll jump through the hoops, right? They'll say, well, we don't want to do that. We'll take care of it, right? And they'll get that to you. So with our SLAs and these, these happen between a company and normally an outside vendor. So normally with our telecom, our internet connection, those are going to, um, include the service level agreements. And a lot of times <laughs> with our online um, environment, uh, this is one of those things that we normally click next to, or I agree, right? And when we install software, sometimes there's some of these agreements that basically say, you know, hey, this is, um, this is what's gonna happen if this happens, right? Like how many of you were, um, uh, watching or uh, maybe you even participated in that whole um, the GameStop short sell on uh, with the Reddit page and then um, Robinhood and Robinhood stopped trading GameStop because it was so volatile and a bunch of people were like oh you can't do that how dare you you know uh, this is America I have the right to buy and sell whatever I want on and then, you know, Robin Hood basically said, well, here's what you signed. This is what you agreed to when you clicked on I agree. Uh, when you installed the app and when you joined Robin Hood, created an account. And, you know, at that point, it's like, okay, yeah, they, they, it's in the fine print. So um, we, we need to be careful with that as to know what's in our fine print with our agreements. Okay, we should know what operating network operating system versions and types are in use. Because we may say, well, we have a Windows Server 2012 out there and it's a, um, the standard edition. And we may want that to run a, a service, but that service is only available on the enterprise edition. Well, if we don't know what versions are out there, we may come up with this plan and say, we're going to install this on this server. We'll configure it like this. We'll run through blah, blah, blah. We'll do our tests. And then we get to that particular server and it gives us an error message that says, this service is not supported in this version of Windows. And by then it's a little late to say, oops, uh, let's go back to the drawing board and start over. So knowing what's out there and what we're working with is super important. Okay, um, we may want to look at how is our administrative systems structured. You know, are we basing it on roles? 
So based on your job description, you will have certain permissions. So for example, we may deploy a new system and we'll say, well, um, you know, uh, John works in that office. He's not, he doesn't work in IT, but he's a, a user in that office. Let's set him up so that his system will automatically initiate a backup of, you know, all the information in their department. And then we find out, well, John is a temporary employee and we don't want to give him the backup operator uh, permissions on that because his job description would not, it, it would not be feasible. Now, Mary may be in that same office and she may be like the, the accounting um, supervisor in the finance department. We can say, well, she's going to have permissions to back up the, all the data that is part of a backup because she can see that data based on her job description. We would not want John to see it because if he can back up that data, he can see that data. So we wanna make sure that our permissions are assigned properly. Um, and the functions that are associated with those permissions are um, correctly matched so that they map out correctly. Okay, um, and that discretionary control is part of that is too. Localizations, again, with the language boundaries. Where does um, um, one part of our network, if it, especially if it's global, where, where do we kind of draw those boundaries? And where do those language packs and those language situations need to be implemented? Okay. You know, like for example, if, if our website is in the United States, and it has um, most of our connectivity is coming from the continental United States, we probably don't need to install a bunch of foreign languages on it, right? We may need, you know, Spanish and English and, you know, um, whatever else, I'm not sure. But, you know, we would base that again on our utilization reports, okay? So uh, there's that. Now we, we should know what file systems are on our server equipment. So if, if we're going to um, have a bunch of Macintosh users and we want them to use our file share, but our file share is all using NTFS, uh, you know, we need to know that Mac cannot natively, automatically anyway, read and write to an NTFS file system. There's a third party app. There's a program we do need to install on every single Macintosh so that it can read and write to NTFS. So if we're gonna build a system that is going to have clients that use a Mac and we're not aware of the file system on our servers or on our storage, we're gonna run into some major problems. We may have FAT32. And we know that FAT32 can only support files. A single file can only go up to four gigabytes in size. So let's say we have a system that we're going to use storage on a server for this system. And it's a, say they're recording videos like we're doing today with recording our video. And we know video files get very, very large, even if they're compressed. So, uh, you know, we're recording meetings all the time and we want to store that and they go to store it and they get an error that says um, read write error. And the user goes, what? Why can't this system write to that wherever it's supposed to store it? Well, because the file system is not the correct one. So we may need to you know, know where that data is being stored and what file systems on it. So there's a lot. When we, when we look under the hood, of um, these servers and we start poking around and saying, well, I'm gonna do this, this, and this. There are a lot of little details that we've gotta be aware of. We, we just can't say, well, let's just do it. Sounds good, let's do it, <laughs> you know, go do that. I mean, there's a lot of details that have to be looked at. Some other things, we should know where's our DNS, our domain name services, where is our DHCP, right? Our uh, dynamic host control protocol. 
where are our directory services? Where are our print services? Where are our file services? And how will all of these tie in, right? Now we talked about infrastructure earlier. These are considered, especially DNS and DHCP and Active Directory, those are considered network infrastructure services. Now they're not equipment, but they're, they're service, servers and services that we have to have available on our network for it to work. Because most of our client workstations, we just plug them in, turn them on, update them, assign a few permissions and away they go, right? We don't configure the network card. We don't configure DNS. We don't configure the logon screen in the logon um, schema. Those things are done automatically with our infrastructure, which makes it really easy. Now we need to set them up in our server and believe me, we'll do DNS, DHCP and Active Directory multiple times in this class on our servers to get those going. Okay, print and file services too. We need to know where they are and what they do. Yes, the downside, Louis asked about um, using Google's DNS as a backup solution. That's okay for internet, but most of these things, these infrastructure things are internal. So like Google is not gonna know where our um, server1.cnet.lab is. They have no clue. They don't know what that is because that's an internal system. So internally, we need our own DNS. And that's what, what I'm talking about. External, we get our DNS. It can be come from our ISP. It can come from, D, from Google. It can come from you know, any of the other uh, publicly available. And those are good. We'll do a lab where I'll have you change the DNS to the outside just so our internet connection will work properly with our internal um, system. So in a couple of weeks, we're gonna do a routing lab and we'll have to make sure that that's configured so that we have internet connectivity to go do what we need to do. Okay, so you, knowing both is, is crucial, right? Now, um, we should be able to determine uh, some of the services and applications. So some applications will require certain network protocols to be available. So some of the older stuff, and, and trust me, remember we said, why are businesses in business? To make money. And if it's not broke, don't fix it. And if they're making money and their application is 25 years old, but it still works, they're not gonna update it just to update it. Right now, if there's security problems, if there's you know usability, if there's features, if there's anything like that, they'll probably think about upgrading. But if it's working as is, you don't change just to change. So sometimes that means it's legacy, it's older. So there may be certain network services like NetBIOS and WINS, the Win um, name services, Windows naming services that were predated. DNS and IP, Internet Protocol, which is IP and DNS are how modern networks run um, all the time. But some of this older stuff may have older things. And if we're not aware of that and we deploy a new server that doesn't support net bias, all of a sudden we have a troubleshooting scenario where like, why doesn't this work? I can ping it. Well, it's not using ping. It's not using IP. It's using NetBIOS, which is the older Microsoft um, network protocol. So, you know, we have to be aware of that. And then again, we talked about our applications, if they're custom or retail. If it's custom coded, can anybody modify the source code, right? Maybe the person that coded it no longer works at the company, right? Maybe he wrote this code you know, five years ago, and now he, this guy's been gone for, you know, two or three years. And the, the source code may not be super readable. We may not even have anybody on site that knows how to program in that language. Like, uh, remember um, when the COVID um, pandemic first started, there was a big push. They wanted um, all these uh, programmers for all this medical uh, source code and it was all written in an ancient language called COBOL. And 
they were there were job descriptions for COBOL programmers, and the only people that were responding to it were these baby boomers, these these boomers that were you know in their 60s and 70s, and they were like, yeah, I remember I wrote uh, COBOL all through the 80s, but I retired in you know 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and they were getting these jobs to um, modify this COBOL program because it was you know it worked, but it wasn't you know. Uh, it couldn't handle the the certain functions that they now needed during the pandemic. And then if you have software agreements, support agreements in place, who does what, right? If you have a problem with blue screens and you call Microsoft, that's not covered by the standard user agreement. But if you have a support agreement with Microsoft, it is, right? So, you know, when Microsoft phased out Windows XP and Server 2003, there were some companies, and you know, the example I always use is the U.S. Navy. They had a bunch of um, of their ships that used XP for their navigation system. So the the ship's main navigation system was supported by Windows XP. And when Microsoft said this is the deadline to stop support unless you have an extended service agreement, and you know, they charged an arm and a leg, but you know the the Navy had to have it, otherwise their part of their fleet is not an operational and they paid exorbitant amounts for <laughs> supporting XP. All right, identify um, our security. So security is a big part of this as well. Who has access? And are we going to use our group structure to leverage um, our access? because it's way easier, especially in large environments to say, let me put all these users in a group that makes sense and then assign permissions to the group. So I have all these users, I put them in a group and then I give permissions to the group. Instead of saying, well, here's 10,000 users, I need to put all 10,000 users in the permissions for this file. That would be a nightmare. I mean, it's way easier to say, let me take these 10,000, add them into this group, and then give permissions to the group. And that's how we're going to do our access control. So we'll do that in um, a couple of our labs. Now, we're not going to have 10,000 users, but we'll simulate a, a large user group by saying like user one, user 10,000, and then we just assume the other 9,999 are in between. Um, and we'll, we'll assign our permissions accordingly. Um, our file system security features, right? If we go back to our file system, which we had back here, FAT32, which is common on a lot of our NAS devices, right? Our network attached storage, because it's, it's fast and universally accessible. But FAT32 only has two permissions. You have full control or you have no control. So that's not really a good way to say security. So if we look at the file system and we need to apply this security control to determine if that file system will work within what we want to do from a security standpoint. Okay, some of the other things from a security standpoint is we need to harden our servers, which means we turn off any unneeded services and ports. We need to have a plan for including all of our uh, updating our security patches. When do we do that? I mean, if I were to say, go on the internet right now, go to Google and search for um, security violations, corporate security violations, most of the, the articles that you would find would come back with a, a thing that said, there was a patch released for this server two years ago, 18 months ago, four years ago, that was never applied and that's why it was vulnerable. So it's not like, you know, the cure isn't out there, it's just we need to apply it. And that's where we come into play as the server admins and we're gonna talk about um, updating here in a second. So, but we need to make sure that's there. Do we have host space intrusion prevention system and um, a client or um, the, the server based intrusion prevention. And IPSs, they not only warn us, but they block it, 
right? They're, they're an active element to our security. What security protocols are we going to use? Are we going to use IPsec, which it does the encryption for us? Are we going to use VPNs so that we can, you know, um, make sure that we're going through a public tunnel or a private tunnel through a public infrastructure? So if we're in today's day and age with the remote um, learners and remote connectivity, VPN is very important. Okay. Any any questions on what I've covered so far? I know I'm going through these slides kind of rapid fire, um, but this these are this is just kind of overall general information that we were we need to be aware of, and we'll come back where we need to apply this in um, our design, and when we build a server, I'll highlight that as we go through that, okay? I don't see any questions. So another thing we need to look at is um, with the security is where are our logs going, right? One of the big problems with log files is the, it's the needle in the haystack. There is just so much information, I mean, Go go into your, if you have a Windows machine, go into your event viewer and look at your Windows security logs and just look at the amount of data that's in there. If your machine's been online for six months or longer, you probably have 10,000 entries in just your one machine. Now imagine a server that's getting 10,000 interactions every minute. Imagine the amount of data that's in there. So knowing um, where the logs are and then taking the time, which is you know not the most glamorous thing in IT is reading log files, but you've got to do it. Someone has to do it. Because otherwise, if you just stick your head in the sand and say, everything looks good down here and you're not looking at what's actually going on, I mean, that's a recipe for disaster. So you want to be very careful um, with that. And then we need to know what tools or services are being audited we may not want every single successful logon to be logged because if it's successful, we assume, you know, it's, it's authorized. But what we may want to log are unsuccessful. That way we can see if somebody's trying, you know, someone's jiggling your door handle, it'd be nice to know who's, who's doing that, right? You know, so we can kind of build our defenses against that. This OOB or out of band management or in band, normally we want a separate network or a virtual network that only our management, our administrators, our server techs can access the server functions on that. So our file share may be on a separate network and then our management will be on another network so that only our admins can see the log files, our regular users can't. Okay, and then we of course would wanna make sure in our written security policy that we have some information written in there about our server security so that we can address some of these things and make sure that they're uh, uh, covered when the, we onboard a new person or HR hire somebody that they can get that squared away as well. Okay, so here's, here's a log file from a firewall. This is just a, a uh, firewall uh, that says this on this date, um, it came in on this interface using this protocol. And normally a zero means um, any protocol and then a port means any port. So it says this came in looking for this IP address. Now, um, for those of you that have taken networking, you know that this 224.0.0.1 uh, .0 is used for multicasting. So this is uh, this machine is just kind of looking, where can I get my multicasting information? That's what this one's saying. This next one used TCP port 1781 going to this destination IP address. So this network 87.5.83, 87.5.110, that's probably on the same network. And it's looking for Microsoft domain services. This one is looking for Microsoft net bias with the 135 and HTTP. So if we were to look through our log files and we saw a whole bunch of traffic 
going to port 21, right, which is FTP. And we know, I mean, we know that we do not have FTP on our network, but we were getting all, all kinds of hits from um, foreign IP addresses to our server on port 21. What would that tell you? Would, would that be a good thing or would that kind of raise your alert that something might be going wrong? Anybody? It would alert me. Say that again? It, it would alert. alert it me. would be an alert, right? Because if we're not using FTP, but someone in the outside is using our server for FTP, that server has been compromised somehow. And maybe they're uploading um, pirated movies, they're uploading, you know, illegal files, you know, something that may not be um, legal in this country or whatever. Uh, we, but if we don't know about it, if our head's in the sand, we never look at these logs, that could be a big problem. Okay, so Alan, you asked about um, using a DNS filter and then a proxy server. A proxy is going to be a lot more active. We can, we can do a lot more with a proxy server. Like we could do a redirect that says, hey, if you go to this site, read this manual, right? Do a, a redirect to maybe our policy manual. Whereas with a, a DNS filter, normally those will just block it. Those say this site is not allowed, right? If you use um, uh, DNS filters to, to do that. So good question. Now you can do both um, on there, but just the proxy is gonna give you more flexibility. All right, so there's the, the logs. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop right there. Uh, I know some of you just got on, but um, let's let's take another break. Let's do this one until um, 10 o'clock. So five minutes from now and warm up your Red Bull and, and then get your, what, what coffee did you have? Colombian coffee, Troy? That sounds good right now. Um, so let's come back at 10 o'clock and then we'll continue going through this. All right, be right back.
All right, so Robert went to get G Fuel, six coffee for the morning. Wow, for Luis, that's a lot. Um, Cisco, <laughs> Sour Rug, uh, Shiny Splash. The videos are recorded. Yeah, you, you need to, um, the, in the link, there's a password, passcode at the end of it. So you click on the link and then copy and paste the password in there and it'll, it'll get right in there. Um, yeah, you don't use your Monsat credential. You just put in the passcode that is on the link. All right, so um, the next section here, we can talk about with how is the, the, situate, the server gonna be administrated? Do we have a centralized IT? Like, is there one IT for the whole um, corporation or does each department kind of have their own IT? The most common way is the hybrid where there's maybe some people uh, in the department that has IT access and IT experience. And then there's a larger video or larger, um, uh, the corporate IT where they um, take care of the bigger projects. Uh, what management tools are available, right? What, how can management see what's going on? Are there tools available that they can log in, they can get a quick snapshot, maybe a dashboard that gives them a splash screen of um, what's going on and where, okay? How do we do our backups, right? We put this new server in place, we have this new project, but uh, where does it fit in our backup schedule? Where does, it, where does it get added into, you know, when it gets backed up? Um, we wanna make sure that we don't have a single point of failure, right? The, the better um, redundancy we can have in our networks, the, the more secure and the more reliable our network will be. Do we have um, hot standby with our failover clustering? We're gonna do a clustering lab where we'll actually have a a uh, file share and we'll, we'll have a cluster of it where it's a uh, um, failover and then we'll fail the first one and see if it flips over to the new one automatically. And how does the, that affect the user? Well, hopefully the user is unaffected. That's why we put this stuff in place. Do we have cold, warm and hot sites for business continuity? Do we have an impact analysis that would analyze that, you know, with this, um, COVID and everybody having to, to figure out how to do their businesses online, you know, some industries that was not a, a difficult thing for them to do at all. Others, it was very complicated and, you know, some of them aren't surviving well. I mean, so this business continuity, you know, who could have seen this coming? I mean, that it, it's just a difficult situation for that. But, uh, you know, we, we have to look at that a little bit. Okay, when, when should we um, install drivers, right? If there's uh, new drivers for our server, let's say we have a, um, we're using a, an onboard or an integrated um, RAID controller card for our hard drives. And when we go to install Windows, it, it doesn't recognize our drives because it needs to identify that it's on a RAID controller first. Well, we need to know where, where we can get those drivers. We need to know how to install those drivers, right, beforehand. Um, you know, when we purchase the server, we should run through what's known as the hardware compatibility list, the HCL, and make sure that that server is compatible with VMware, that that server is compatible with Hyper-V, that that server is compatible with server 2019 so that when we get it and we decide to install it, it that it, it actually does what it's supposed to do, okay? So again, this is these are all considerations about our server. So if anything, hopefully you take out of this morning's lecture is it's not as easy as just going to Amazon, buying something and then saying, okay, I'll do that tomorrow and just make it happen. Now, sometimes it works that way and you get lucky, but a lot of times um, your luck runs out and you're gonna end up having to deal with some of these considerations that we've mentioned here. Uh, if possible, always back up a server. 
before you install any driver or any update for that matter, um, do it in a test environment. That way you know exactly what you're up against. You can use restore points and driver rollback. And then once you have it updated, make sure you update the documentation. So if your network card driver changed and then all of a sudden the quality of service changes the way you set that up on each on that server, you know, say to put phone traffic at the top and you know, file downloads at the bottom for priority. Um, make sure you update your documentation so that it, it reflected. Okay. Uh, when we install our network operating systems, uh, we should know if we're going to have the IP address statically or dynamically addressed. Normally, our servers are static. And, and the reason we want our servers to be static is we know our dynamic IP addresses can change. So today, my, my IP address on my workstation may be you know, 10.28.72.192. And then a week from now, it may change to 10.28.72.195. Well, that doesn't really matter if my workstation changes because nobody's accessing anything on my workstation. But let's say our file server or our print server is dynamically assigned. And when we set it up, it's 192. And two weeks from now, it's 195. Well, all of a sudden, all those people that were trying to print to 192 cannot print to 195. So that server is no longer available. So we, we need to know, we, sh we should set our, our servers, our routers, our access points, our um, uh, web cameras, anything that we need to access for either uh, viewing or configuring, those should be set statically. Everything else, normally our clients are set to dynamic. Okay, is the firewall software, firewall software on or off? Do we need to enable PowerShell? Do we have reliability and performance baselines so that we know what normal looks at, right? D have we hardened our server by turning off unneeded services or ports? Do we have a backup procedure, right? Is this server or this, this device that we're putting on our, in our server infrastructure, um, does it have a unique backup capability? And if so, do we need to modify our backup procedures to accommodate that? So all of these things are, are crucial that we take a look at. Okay, um, on, I'm gonna put on um, uh, the, actually I'll, I'll do it here. Let me stop this share for a second. And share screen here. Because the Sun Microsystems, they have a really good article on patch management. Well, I can't, I can't find it off top of my right away. So um, let me, uh, I'll, I'll put that on week three so you can look at it, but it's a really good example of what to do when there's patches or updates on a server. Uh, Sun Microsystem, they make um, workstations and server equipment uh, that and they just do a really good job. It was the best example I saw for that. So we're on 30 seconds. Okay, so the difference between a patch and an upgrade, normally a patch corrects bugs in the software and adds new hardware support, whereas an upgrade will add more features. So 
there's quiz one is next week, right? So what, what we'll do next week is I'll lecture and then we'll stop and we'll do the quiz and then we'll stop that and then do the lab. Um, but the, there's a question that asks about a patch and an upgrade. Um, so a patch adds new hardware support, whereas an upgrade adds new features. So, and a, a patch fixes something, whereas an upgrade just adds new things. Now, a lot of times they'll roll those together with a, a hot fix or um, a service pack that will include all of those, both patches and upgrades. Okay, Windows has a server update service called WSUS, and um, it allows you to control updates. So, because we need to be careful with how we update our servers. Now, our client machine, normally if our Windows 10 machine has an update, we just let those install whenever, right? The user can say, you know, postpone it for four hours or install the update now, or we can say shut down and update or restart and update. And that's fine. But on our servers, we don't want our servers turning on or off or going up or down during their heavy utilization times. So we want to be very careful with that because if we restart a server for an update, that update may fix one thing and break two other things. So I want to be careful about the butterfly effect that you know one little change here can have a major drastic um, impact lay, uh, somewhere else. So we want to keep that uh, in mind. And then whenever we can, test the update before you do it on your actual mission critical um, servers. So if we have a, a virtual machine with that same um, operating system, like say from our um, testing phase, we can come back into it and then apply the update and see what it does. So that will keep it um, safe and less problematic. So here's an update, uh, a WSUS um, screenshot. So this is where we say um, for our light uh, systems, which we would uh, categorize, you know, our work, certain workstations, certain servers, certain uh, machines may be in this. And we'll say, these are the updates that we've approved. And then it will go through and install them. And then we'll see the error messages if they're not there. Okay. Now, the second Tuesday of each month, Microsoft regularly releases patches. And Patch Tuesday it may sometimes be followed by Crash Wednesday. So we always want to make sure that servers are never set to automatically download and install. While most home users' computers, they should be set that way. So there's a big difference between the way we think of patches on our servers and patches on our, on our home machines or our workstations. Now, if we go back, a lot of the security flaws are because something's not patched. And then I just said, we should set our servers to manually install patches. So if we set it to manually, that means we need to be aware of when we should do these patches. So we need to be kind of in both of those worlds. One, we don't just forget patching totally, but we don't have it set automatically. So we want to be in between those two. All right. Now, um, some of the other things is this is just a, a design checklist. Uh, one, how complex can we build our network? And there are some super complicated network designs. We can have all kinds of designs for that make it so elaborate and just a beautiful from a networking standpoint. But if there's somebody that's going to support it and they don't understand all of that, it, it's they're probably going to break it down and set it to the least complicated that they can. So switches and routers can get very complicated. Um, so we need to make sure we address the business needs without making the network overly complicated. Do we need power over Ethernet? Right? Power over Ethernet is more and more our devices need PoE. And I would recommend if you're replacing switches or buying new switches, just buy the ones that include the PoE ports on it. They're not that much more expensive 
And that way you're ready for anything that comes up. I mean, because our phone systems are power over ethernet, our wireless access points are power over ethernet, our camera systems are power over ethernet. So if we have it, we can use it down the road. Even if we don't need those things today, we're future proofing uh, wherever possible. Otherwise you have to use those big ugly injectors that um, you know need their own power and then their own internet or network connection, they get real ugly real fast. How fast would our network need to be? I mean, standard now is probably gigabit, but could we upgrade some of the network cards and be ready for 10 gig? You know, maybe down the road, that's something we need to look at. You know, are they only at 100 megabit? Do we have older um, laptops on our network where the wireless is only, um, you know, 802.11 of uh, G, you know, and now we're on AC and, you know, they, they can't connect to anything or they can, but it's always at a super slow speed and we're wondering why, you know, so make sure that we look at that uh, from a, when we design these things. Redundancy is always important. Um, it's critical. So as much redundancy as possible, build that into your budget. I mean, it will not hurt you down the road to uh, have a, a plan that includes redundancy. Because you know, the, the Murphy's law says things break and when they break, it's always at the worst time. So just if we can plan for that. Okay, standards and maintenance. Will we strive to use only a handful of vendors or are we just gonna have a bunch of different things from a bunch of different manufacturers and equipment um, vendors, you know? It would be nice to say all of our routers are going to be from Cisco. All of our switches will be from Ubiquity. All of our, I mean, it, it'd be nice to say that, but it's not always the case. You know, sometimes these devices, they go out of stock or they go out of um, service or they're no longer supported. Do we have cold spares in our inventory? Like, do we have a, another router on our, uh, on our bench or in our, our cabinet that's ready to go if the, the one that we're using breaks down, can we switch it easily to the one that's ready to, to rock and roll? All we have to do is unrack the old one, pop in the new one, plug it in just like it was, turn it on and away it goes, okay? So here's some of the checklist stuff. We'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, you know, we, IP address in VLAN security and remote access. All right, so that's all of the things that we need to know going into um, our design for the rest of the semester. So you're like, dang, that took two hours and 20 minutes to get to this point. And this is really what the today's all about, is this here. So I'm going to make a few assumptions. So one, let's just assume that we're going to uh, work with a small tax consultancy company located in Walnut, right? I mean, it's tax season, right? If you haven't done your taxes yet, um, you know, you have a, until April 15th to do them this year. And let's say we're a, a relatively small company. They have um, 50 employees. We have strong support from the owner and the CEO which means they're going to probably be receptive to some of our design elements, you know? Um, there is potential for future growth. So we wanna make sure the systems that we use are capable of having at least 50 con con connections, maybe, um, and it should be able to grow up from there uh, down the road. So uh, there's that. Some of the other assumptions, uh, one, we're going to want to implement virtualization technology, and we're going to use both Linux and Windows to perform these server functions, all right? There is no current on-site IT support, so we need to build our systems with remote access that's needed. Now, we're going we're gonna to build our design um, of our network and server infrastructure into three phases. Phase one is um, networks and servers, which is this class. 
Phase two is we'll look at the workstations, which we'll do a little bit of that in this class. And if we have time at the end, we'll make sure that we build our wireless and mobile connectivity into our infrastructure as well. Okay, so, but the main focus is going to be on our networks and our servers, all right? So this is what we're, we're up against, um, and this is what we're going to um, design. So here are some of the things that we will need on our network and our server infrastructure. One, we know that we're gonna need DHCP. And we're going to do DHCP from both the Linux and the Windows virtual machine. So we'll build servers that can do Linux DHCP, and we'll build servers that can do Windows DHCP. So you'll know all about DHCP um, in this course. We need to use Active Directory, and we're going to only use the Windows server Active Directory. There are other Active Directories or Active Directory-like programs that are used um, with Linux. But to get a good understanding, let's use the, the original, the actual Microsoft one. Later on down the road, if you want to you know, see how you can implement that in Linux, um, you know, that's a, a cool little project to do. But for now, we're going to stick with Windows. We need domain name services on our network, and we're going to build that out on both our Linux machines and our Windows virtual machines. We need file sharing, and we're going to do our file sharing from a Windows virtual machine. We need printer sharing. We're going to do that from Windows. Now, the nice thing is when we install Server 2019, one of the only services that is automatically turned on is file and print sharing. So we don't really have to do a lot to get those going. We're going to build some websites, and we're going to do that on both Linux and Windows. That says Linux only, but um, the, the focus will be on Linux. We'll also do it in Windows. We are going to build um, some storage area networks and some network attached storage uh, for our um, network storage. And we're going to do that with both hardware and with some virtuals. We're going to deploy um, Windows using our Windows deployment services. And we'll use Windows for that. We'll do Windows Server update services, which we talked about earlier. We'll do that in a Windows virtual. We're going to build an email server that we're going to use both Linux and Windows to perform that. And then we're going to use um, network address translation for our routers. We'll use our Cisco router that's already um, configured. And then we're going to build our Windows and Linux servers to do our routing as well. OK? So those are some of the services we're going to do. And then these are some of the technologies we're going to incorporate to do it. So we're going to use Windows Server 2019. We're going to use CentOS um, Server 8.0. We're going to use VMware ESXi, which is 6.5. We're going to use Hyper-V that is included in um, Windows Server 2019. We're going to build some honeypots for our security. Um, detection and kind of confusion. And then we're going to make sure we have um, the capability for voice over IP using power over Ethernet where possible. All right. So where are these servers going to be done? And how will this look um, from a, if we were to look at it physically? So we're going to virtualize these environments um, like a mentioned last week, the, in order to do this class, uh, unless each student had, you know, unless we had six, seven servers for each student to configure and then cable them all together, um, we couldn't do this class, but virtually using virtual technology, we can do this. So here's, here's basically how our router, which is connected to our network in our classroom. So that, these are the machines that we are using Apache Guacamole to connect to. So that's on the 10.28.72.0 network. And that connects to Mount Sachs network, which is out there at 10.29.72.0. In the slash 24, that is referring to the number of ones in the subnet mask. 
So for those of you in the networking class haven't taken that yet or in the process of taking it or you haven't taken networking, um, I'll explain that later on, okay? But these are standard class C um, subnet masks for these private IP addresses, all right? So our school network comes through our router into our classroom. So that's step one. Step two is our ESXi server, which is, this is a, a picture of our 1U server, which is in the stock room. And this is going to host our hypervisor, which for the first half of the class is going to be VMware, ESXi, that's what's currently configured. Then after the midterm, we're gonna switch it where we'll install server 2019 and use Hyper-V on this server, okay? Now, some of these virtual machines that are inside of our server is going to be our domain controller, a proxy server, honeypot, our routers, our web servers, file and print share, our mail server, and our deployment servers. All right, so far so good? Yes. Yeah, this is just kind of a bigger picture overview. So um, let's look at what it will look for, like from a logical standpoint. So here's our client servers, our voice over IP and our pen testers, if they're out here. And we're gonna do a security lab where we'll do some um, penetration testing and um, vulnerability exploits on uh, a, a server in a honeypot. So those are our bottom layer. And then we have our domain controller, our web, our file, mail, WDS, WSS, our SAN are located at the server level. And then we have our, um, our next layer, which would be considered like our DMZ, where we'd have our proxy and our honeypot. And then our router level, and I, this is a physical router. This is the one that's in room um, 405 and that connects 405 to the Montsec network. And then this, these are the routers that we're gonna build. And we're gonna do servers as routers in week four. So in a couple of weeks, we'll um, get these built out, all right? So this is what it's going to um, look like when we get everything built. So at the end of the course, now these are all moving parts. So, um, you know, we'll have one domain controller for a file and print share lab we we'll have another domain controller when we do the mail server. So these these parts will kind of shift, but in the end we'll have we'll have built every one of these servers and configured them to do exactly what we're talking about today. All right. So um, let's look at each server and describe its operating system and the role that it will perform. So with our um, router. So I started at the top and I'll work my way down. We're going to use both server 2019 and CentOS for routing. So in week four, we'll do some routing. And um, in another lab, we'll use CentOS for a proxy. And our security lab, we'll use CentOS for our honeypot. We'll use server 2019 for our domain controller, as well as DNS and DHCP. We'll use CentOS for our web server using Apache, and then we'll use um, server 2019 for our web server using the Internet Information Service, IIS. Our file server and our failover clustering will use server 2019. We'll use, um, for our mail server, we use both Exchange uh, on server 2019 and Postfix on CentOS. And for our Windows deployment server, at, near the end, we'll build a Windows deployment server that we'll use to deploy our servers. Um, and that will be hosted on a server 2019 box. And then our update server will also be on server 2019. Okay, so that's what our, what it's going to look like when we build all this stuff. All right, any, any questions on any of this design? that we're doing. Now, some of this, we can modify as we go. Um, the rest of it, we kind of need to uh, stay on the, the course that I've mapped out for us, but I am flexible. 
So if there's if there's something in this that you're like, I wish, could we do that again on Hyper-V, say we do it in um, ESXi, and we know we're going to have to kind of rebuild some of this stuff in the second half of the class on Hyper-V, and you're not sure about it, maybe the DHCP stuff in Linux wasn't crystal clear, um, we can, you know, I'm open to adding and modifying these labs and um, lectures as necessary. So just, just let me know. I mean, it's kind of hard to say that on day two, you know, well, let's change all this because we're not 100% sure yet. But this is what we're going to do. So, you know, if your mom or your, your girlfriend or wife or whatever says, hey, what are you doing in that class? What is servers? You can just show them this slide and say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to build all this stuff and make it work. And they'll go, oh. And if they're like my wife, they go, oh, that's nice. And they'll walk away. <laughs> all right. So the, the next thing I'm going to cover, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but we are going to install server 2019 today. So I just want to give you a look at that um, so that you're aware of what to look for and um, what to be expect when you install it. So um, some of this is redundant. We've, we've covered this as far as like planning. So some networks require more planning than others. Small networks, you know, you may only have a couple decisions before you install. Some of the other ones, you, you have to gather some information. Um, and the network environment and the roles the server will play on the network are key to planning Windows Server. You know, normally we don't just install server to install server. We install server to provide a service on our network. Um, and if we can think through that a little bit um, in the foreground, we will end up with a, a much cleaner design. So we wanna keep that in, in mind as we go. So some of the hardware considerations, you know, what CPU are we going to use, AMD or Intel? And I'm going to tell you up front, I prefer Intel processors in my servers. Um, you can do both. Generally speaking, from my experience, Intel's um, don't run as hot. AMD processors do get a little warmer. Um, they've come a long way, right? The Ryzen CPU has been a, a real excellent processor for AMD. Um, but if, if I had to, you know, if someone asked me to consult for a server build, I would, I would still go with Intel at this point. Um, some of you may be big fans of Intel, of AMD. Uh, I don't say that to, you know, step on your toes or anything. Just me, I would do Intel. Okay. Do we need um, a server processor? Or do we need a workstation, just a standard workstation processor? Depending on the load, we may want to, um, if we know we're going to build a bunch of virtuals, we probably want to go with the um, server line of the processor. OK, how many total physical processors do we want in our machine? How many cores? How many um, uh, virtual processors on there? Uh, multiple core CPUs aren't necessarily as good as multiple physical processors. So they make server motherboards that actually have more than one processor socket. That's a multiple processor. Do we need 32-bit versus 64-bit? This doesn't really matter anymore because Microsoft doesn't support. Their server OS has to run on 64-bit. And 32-bit are kind of a... Uh, a dinosaur at this point. Okay, are we going to virtualize? And if so, our CPU needs to support that, right? We mentioned this last week with the um, hardware accelerated virtual virtualization, right? The HAV. Um, most modern processors, especially server processors, will include that. This is built in. Do do we need some sort of a disk subsystem, right? Do we need RAID? And, and if so, what RAID level? Does it have a hot swappable um, disk feature? Is the memory hot swappable? 
are the CPUs hot swappable, right? And what we get with hot swappability is there's no downtime. So if we're in a mission critical environment, we may want to consider, let's make sure that the server can, we can change its processor, we can change its memory without ever shutting it down. But that means a lot more money, okay? So these features to, to have a cost. Um, how are we going to name our servers? So this I do want to get into these links because they're kind of funny. Um, let me... I'm going to open another file. Hold on a second. Oh, there, those links didn't come across. All right, well, anyway, there's some really funny ways that you can um, uh, name your servers. You know, some people will use, um, you know, like the name of the Simpsons, you know, Simpson names, um, uh, a lot of Star Wars, you know, a lot of server admins are Star Wars fans and they'll name their servers, you know, Obi-Wan or um, Han Solo or whatever. Um, on for a season on the network I was working on when Seinfeld was really important, I tried to design the servers with um, uh, Seinfeld names. So like our mail server was called Newman because Newman worked at the post office. Uh, and then Jerry was one of our fi uh, file shares and George was one of our um, domain controllers and all this stuff. and. Um, you, you can get some pretty crazy naming conventions um, on that. But uh, you, you, we need to make sure our, our servers need a unique name and they should be somewhat descriptive. So when we name our servers, there's, there's two places we need to name our servers. One, the name of the virtual machine. So when we build the virtual machine, it needs a unique name it, that's descriptive. And then two, when we start up the virtual machine, it, it needs to have a, a net, uh, the server name. So the, the name and the server. And I'll show you this when we um, get into, today's server doesn't matter if we name it because we're just gonna use that as the parent um, for the clone. Um, but we, we wanna make sure that our servers are named um, logically. Okay, we should know what kind of protocols we're gonna use. Um, Windows installs both TCP IP version four and version six by default. Now, if you need older protocols, you can find third party solutions for that. Like IPX, SPX is used by some older um, uh, network servers that may be out there. They're super legacy. So I want to um, imagine that. Uh, Windows, the IP address, it uses uh, automatic IP addresses by default, our servers are set to get an automatic IP address, but in almost every lab, we're gonna assign our servers a static IP address. We don't want those to be um, uh, dynamic. We want those to be static, okay? We should know the time zone that we're in, which for us is a Pacific Standard time zone. If we're gonna be a work group or a domain, and we'll talk about that more later. And then what are we gonna install on our server, what roles do we need? Okay, now there's two ways we can perform a clean install of our servers. And we have two types of installs, an upgrade and a clean install. 
clean installation is which whatever's on there is gone. So if there is an existing operating system on that hard drive, a clean install will wipe it. It'll completely repartition and rebuild it. Whereas an upgrade will upgrade what's already there. Now on our servers, in our environment, we're going to use um, ISOs, the, the, the server 2019 um, eval.iso file, which remember last week we copied those to our desktop so that we have them there where we can move them around as needed. So, um, and then after install begins, it will tell you Windows loading. It may ask you to choose the language, the time, and the keyboard configuration. So here's the that screen. And for us, we just click next here, right? The, the defaults as far as United States and the keyboard using the US keyboard layout, those are what we want to use. Okay. After you click install, right? We click in next and then the install. Now you will be prompted to enter the product code unless you're installing the evalu evaluation edition, which we are. Now our evaluation edition is good for 180 days. So it'll last us well past the end of this course. Um, and then the next uh, section will ask you, what type of install do you wanna install? So we wanna make sure uh, that you always select the bottom one here, the Windows Server 2019 Data Center Evaluation Desktop Experience. If you do standard, or the data center evaluation only, these are server core versions. This one is the standard version. We want the data center so that um, all of our services are available, okay? So since it's an eval, we're not worried about licensing. We're gonna use the, the more expensive data center, all right? Now, um, later on, you'll accept a license, do a custom install, and determine what disk you're gonna use. So for us, normally we'll have an unallocated space because we're doing a clean install on a virtual. So when we build our virtual machine, which we'll do our first one of that today in lab, um, and we give it, we're gonna do 40 gigs. We don't need 60 gigs of space for our virtuals yet. Uh, when we set it up, allocate the disk space in the virtual machine setting, the drive here will show up and we'll just click next. We don't have to do new. We don't need to load a driver. If we ever do an install and there is no disk showing up here, no drive, that normally means we have to load a driver. And yeah, the, Troy, there is a lab today. Lab two is today. Okay. Now, you can load the driver using um, the F, the uh, load driver there, and then you need to have that on a USB drive. Okay, now Windows will begin the install once we click next, next, next. Um, and after the install is finished, it will ask you for the admin password. So it will set the administrator account and it will ask for the password. The password we're going to use in this course for all of our installs is CNET, um, capital C and then lowercase NET 2021 exclamation point. So the same one we used last week, we're gonna use that throughout this course, okay? And it has to have um, uh, the uppercase, lowercase numbers and a special character. So our password does meet that requirement, okay? Now we can do uh, all of this, and if you install the wrong edition, you can change it using this um, this uh, DISM command prompt. So you open a command prompt and you can do this. I've had um, to do this in the past. Unfortunately, these features don't work with the data with the evaluation version. So if you install the wrong version, today. So if you do not select here, the data center evaluation, um, your only recourse is to restart, to rebuild it, to, to do it again. You can't do an upgrade on it. Now on a regular install of fully licensed, not the eval versions, you can do that 
um, and it will work just fine. Okay. Um, and then you can click on load a driver. And then once our machines run, they need to have internet access. So by default, they're going to, um, ESXi, when we build our VM, will be on a bridge network connection. So it will have internet connection. So as soon as we load, you'll notice in the, the bottom right of your server that it will say um, uh, evaluation not activated. And then if, you, if it has internet access, which it will, and then you restart the server, that will go away and it'll say uh, license valid for 180 days. Then every day you use it, it will go down um, by one day, okay? We should make sure the date and time are correct. And then if we're provisioning the server, which we're not today, we're just building the server, that's going to become our parent. So remember, we're gonna build a bunch of children from our parents so we don't have to install server every single time. Okay, so that'll save us a lot of time in these labs. But on our once the children are set up, we'll assign static IP addresses, give it a name, configure automatic updates, which for this class, we're gonna just turn off automatic updates because we're, we're behind the firewall, we're doing everything internal, we're in a lab environment, so we're just learning. Um, we do not need um, updates. So everything we're gonna do will work without the updates, okay? Patches, service packs, we've talked about this. Um, and then this is the server manager. So when we start our server, it will load this program by default called server manager. And then we have a dashboard, local server, all servers, and then file and storage services. This file and storage services, this is here because by default, Windows Server 2019 automatically installs this service out of the box. Everything else, DHCP, Active Directory, DNS, um, iSCSI, all the things we're gonna need later on, we need to um, go into this um, manage and then we can click install service uh, later on. And I'll show you how to do that um, in the upcoming labs, okay? Now we can ins view installed updates in the local server properties and we can see what's there. On a production server, we definitely wanna make sure that our updates are in accordance with um, our security profile. So if we know there's a patch out there for, you know, the .NET framework, we wanna make sure we um, install that so that we're as secure as possible. Okay, if we expand our network, um, we can have more than one domain controller, right? Remember I said where we can, we should plan on redundancy and a, an additional domain controller is extremely helpful um, in those regards, okay? Now we can have a read-only domain controller, which is not changeable. All it does is kind of, is a satellite of our original domain controller. And in remote offices, that's a good idea because normally there's not anybody there that can manage it. So we'll do it all remotely. Um, okay, there's a couple different names that we can have for our server as far as the what it does. A member server means it, it's part of a domain, whereas a standalone server is not part of a domain. So, uh, and a domain is, means that we've installed Active Directory. So once we install Active Directory, then it be, it, it's eligible to be on a domain. And the first time we um, install Active Directory, it will create a domain. So we'll create a forest and a domain, and then um, any subsequent will attach our servers, we'll make them member servers, so they'll be attached to the domain, and then our domain policies will be pushed out to that um, server. Okay, some of our servers, like our routers, they can be standalone. They do not need to be part of the domain, but they need to be accessible by our network. And we'll, we'll discuss that when we get to that point. Okay, reasons to add servers. One, your company grows. One, they overload, or we need to isolate certain applications. Some systems play well with other systems, some do not. So if we have something that doesn't like playing 
with another system, we need to put it on its own server. And this can lead to that server sprawl, All right? Fault tolerance, branch offices. Um, there's two ways we can upgrade our um, servers, either an in-place upgrade or a role migration. We're not gonna do any upgrading um, in this class. That's, that's beyond the scope of what we're doing here, okay? In-place upgrade. Here's the upgrade table. Uh, there's some um, situations where you can only upgrade from one version to another. You can only uh, upgrade, migrate from a 32-bit to a newer version because you can't upgrade from 32-bit to 64-bit. There's no path for that. So it, in all honesty, whenever I've had a server that I wanted to move from one version to another, I always did a clean install. So I, I backed up that server, got everything um, migrated or, or set to um, create a new server, then move everything over and then decommission the old one. Um, for me, I just had a better peace of mind about that. Okay, server core is where you don't get a GUI. All you get is a command prompt. So when you turn on your server, all you, your command, all you get is command prompt. And then you have to run all the commands um, from the, the command line. Whereas the GUI has the user in, the graphical user interface. We're going to do everything with GUI. Um, and we're not going to do anything with server core. Again, if there was a part two to this class, like say CNET 59 or whatever the course number, which there isn't, um, then read only domain controllers and server core would probably be covered there. But uh, it's good to know about it. Okay, first task when you set up your server um, is one, set the IP, give it a name, and then activate it, just like on the GUI. What not to use in server core, I'm gonna skip some of this. Um, so uh, most of the server core stuff is done through PowerShell. So we can install features with the get-windows feature. Um, this is called a, a, an applet, which is used in PowerShell. We we'll do a lab later on where we'll um, introduce and utilize PowerShell exclusively to do some of the things we've done um, throughout. And uh, here's some more PowerShell stuff. Okay, so all that's with the uh, command line. Okay, so some, to summarize this section, it's pretty straightforward to install Windows Server 2019. And I wish I could um, say that it's exciting, but it's not. It's, uh, you know, watch the paint dry, not super um, motivating to watch, but, you know, it is part of the IT life is you're going to have to install operating systems. And unfortunately, we're going to have to do that to get things um, set up going forward. OK. And uh, that's that's it for the summary. All right. Any uh, questions or comments on the install? Yeah, Newman was the, the mail server because he's the post office worker. Any other questions? <laughs> All right, um, let's take another one last break um, and then we'll come back and uh, we'll, I'll get started with the lab. I'm gonna do another recording um, for the lab recording so I can separate those. So I'm gonna stop this recording. Let's come back at um, 11.15. So about 20 minutes from now, that will give you enough time if you need to get a snack or, you know, munch on something you can. Because um, I need to uh, grab something to eat real quick, too. Uh, and then at 1115, we'll come back and we'll um, I'll, I'll get you started on the lab and get you rolling on lab. OK, so I'm going to stop the recording, and then we'll come back at 1115.